Okay, let's have a, a think about different kind of perspectives on connectivity. So for you as an end user, um, you'll probably have a somewhat different view uh, of the internet than perhaps what your ISP might have. Uh, so from your view, you're using uh, the mouse cursor, uh, one or more hosts and devices, maybe some tablets and things and laptops and phones. Um, they will connect through some access point into your internet service provider. Uh, and the means of getting there will be uh, some kind of access technology. So here in Australia, uh, where I'm based, we have the National Broadband Network, which uses a mixture of fiber optic, um, ADSL, in particular VADSL or VDSL. Uh, there's fixed wireless uh, satellite uh, as well. Last year I was living in the outback and we were using a satellite internet connection for the whole year. Uh, or good old uh, cellular networks. So there's a bunch of access technologies that will get you from your device into your ISP and then inside the ISP they will have uh, a variety of different uh, you know routers and uh, devices that will uh, you know connect you through eventually to their peering points into other ISPs and onto back uh, bones on the internet and those sorts of things uh, and then of course the whole rest of the internet uh, from our end user perspective is uh, is somewhat vague in that we don't have enough information through locality for example to understand what's going on and so it's this kind of nebulous, the rest of the internet, uh, which again, this view, uh, you know, this, this abstraction of not needing to know how all it all works is actually one of the great strengths of the internet. Uh, and it again comes from this uh, layered network model. So if we start thinking then about network links, so there's been quite a lot of theory uh, and theoretical work done on understanding the capacity of communications media to carry a signal uh, and working out what the maximum data speed is because everyone wants everything to go faster. Uh, so how can you work out what the maximum speed is in particular uh, conditions on a particular medium uh, so that you can tell how close you're getting to being able to, uh, uh, to the maximum, you know, how efficiently are you using that? So this comes down uh, through through um, Shannon and Hartley, uh, they looked into this and they basically found out that the easier it is to discern your signal from the background noise, say for example on a, a radio, like on a wireless system, uh, there'll be some interference. The lower that interference is, the more information you can put through uh, on a particular channel uh, in a particular time. So if we have a look uh, at the uh, the formula here, so C is the channel capacity is equal to B. This is the bandwidth multiplied by the uh, the base two log because we're thinking about how many bits, so it's binary data, so base two of uh, one plus S, which is the signal strength, and N is the noise level. So if, for example, we had uh, a bandwidth uh, that went between three hundred hertz and 3,300 hertz, so this is essentially what old telephone lines used to be capable of doing. If we take away 300 from 3,300, that leaves us with 3,000 hertz, three kilohertz. Um, S is the signal power, and N is the average noise, as we've said. Um, so our signal to noise ratio uh, is traditionally measured in decibels. So this is essentially a, a log 10 scale uh, of the signal to noise ratio. So a signal to noise ratio of 1000 is equivalent to 30 dB uh, because uh, uh, 1000 log 10 is 3 times 10 is 3. Uh, so that's decibels, which is why it's times 10. If it was just in bells, then it would be uh, 3 instead of 30. Uh, okay, so let's have a look at this example. So if we say that we have a signal to noise ratio of a thousand, so the signal is a thousand times larger, if we look at this on an oscilloscope or something else, uh, than the, uh, the background noise, and we have a bandwidth of three kilohertz, this will give us a channel capacity of 3000 uh, hertz uh, times the log two of a thousand and one. So this is going to give us roughly 30 kilobits per second. Uh, and indeed, so this is what uh, some of the you know, the modems uh, that we use for a long time would get to 28.8 kilobits. So they were quite efficient in terms of reaching that uh, channel capacity. Of course, you needed to have a particularly clear line uh, for that to work. Otherwise, the signal to noise ratio was worse 
uh, and good modems would tolerate that uh, by dropping the speed back. Uh, and it, really good modems would increase the speed again as the line conditions improved. So let's have a think. If we wanted to get to 56 kilobits, we could actually work out what the signal to noise ratio would be that we would need. Um, or how much additional bandwidth we would need to have access to uh, on the line. So there's different ways that you can increase the, uh, the bandwidth on a link and uh, I'll leave it to the, uh, the reader as an exercise uh, to have a, a think through about what some uh, solutions would be that would get us to 56 kilobits. So we, we keep talking about communications links uh, and so it's helpful for us to actually uh, explain what we mean by that. So really what we're talking about is some means of connecting two things. It's the link that ties them together. Uh, so in that sense, it has quite a, a natural meaning. And then within computer networks, we tend to talk about uh, the different kinds of links. And so broadly speaking, there are those that go through free space. So uh, unguided media uh, versus those that use some kind of guided media. So that might be uh, a copper cable. It might be a fiber optic cable. Uh, and so there is a, a variety of, uh, of different ways that we can classify out uh, these different communications links. And so we've also spoken uh, a little, we've just introduced as we looked at the, um, uh, the capacity of a channel, this idea of frequency. And so this is in Hertz, which means how many times per second uh, an electromagnetic wave oscillates. And there is a, um, uh, so when it does a full oscillation, so it goes from, you know, uh, from say a low point to a high point and back to a low point, um, that gap between the low points or actually between the high points, because it's actually, it's, it's equivalent, um, is the wavelength. And so if we get the speed of light divided by the wavelength, you get the frequency or speed of light divided by the frequency, you'll get the wavelength. Um, so if we look again at uh, on a copper cable, so on a telephone cable, uh, and we have uh, at 300 hertz, so the bottom end of that frequency band that modems uh, will tend to use. Um, and if we know that uh, the speed of light uh, in copper is about uh, two thirds of, um, uh, uh, of three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, divide that by the 300 hertz, and we end up with uh, a wavelength of about 667 kilometers in the copper. This is a very long uh, wave. As we increase the frequency, the wavelength, of course, uh, reduces considerably. Uh, and if we're thinking about visible light and those sorts of things, then we're talking about very much sub millimeter wavelengths. And whatever frequency we're using, whatever link technology we're using, at the end of the day, we actually need to have some way of putting binary data uh, to transfer it over this link. And so this is called encoding. So we encode the data uh, onto uh, the signal. And modulation is the mechanism by which we do that encoding. So we might, for example, modulate how tall those waves are. So when they're jiggling, whether they jiggle a long way, that might be a one and a little jiggle might be a zero. Uh, or we might change the frequency. So we change how fast it's jiggling between a one and a zero uh, with two nearby frequencies. Or we might change the phase of the wave. Um, or we might do some combination of these. Uh, there's lots of different ways to, uh, to modulate a signal. Uh, and there's continuing uh, research in trying to find improved modulation methods. So uh, one area where this is happening at the moment is looking at the next generation of emergency safety beacons that you can kind of you know turn on anywhere on the surface of the earth and have that report your location so emergency services can find you. For example, uh, if you're in a boat uh, and the motor fails. Uh, and in order to have more interesting services like actually better communications in both directions, we need to use that very limited link budget uh, very carefully. And one way to do that is actually to use uh, better modulations that can get closer to the channel capacity uh, or conversely uh, tolerate much higher uh, you know, uh, background noise, depending on the particular context of that. Okay, uh, and we'll stop there and come back in the next video.